Hello, and welcome back to the Record of Arms. I'm your host, Mark Seven, and I'm glad to have you back with me here today for the next part of my series on the wartime career of the Douglas SBD Dauntless Dive Bomber. This episode will conclude what will probably be the largest section of my survey of the operation of American SBDs, their part in the campaigns in the Southwest Pacific Theater. As always, the sources for this one can be found in the description box, along with a link to my Patreon, if you like what I do here and would like to help support the show. So, without any further ado, let's get back into it. While the Americans were struggling their way up the Solomon's Island chain, a parallel battle between the Allies and the Japanese Empire was taking place in the large island of New Guinea. This differed in character from the Solomon's campaign in two major respects. First, was the much greater involvement of non-American troops, principally Australians and New Zealanders, on the Allied side. Secondly, the battle here was more like a continental land campaign than the island-hopping naval and air battle in the Solomons. One result of this is that the United States Army and the Army Air Forces play a more prominent role in the fighting here than they do in the Solomons. New Guinea is one of the largest islands in the world, with an area of more than 785,000 square kilometers, or about 350,000 square miles, making it second only to Greenland. The terrain was mostly rugged and forested, with a spine of mountains running down the center, roughly dividing the island into northern and southern halves. The southeastern half of the central range of highlands, where much of the bitter fighting took place, is known as the Owen Stanley Range, after the captain whose ship first surveyed the coast in 1849. These mountains rise as high as 4,000 meters, or about 13,000 feet. Infrastructure in the form of roads and bridges was very limited, though harbor and air facilities were somewhat more developed. The principal means of overland transit through the mountains were trails and tracks, running from the Allied base at Port Moresby, northwards through the few practicable passes towards Buna. These tracks were primitive and few in number, and passed through extraordinarily difficult ground. Even without enemy opposition, traversing this terrain was difficult, and the passage was slow and arduous. Thus, overland advance could not be expected to take place at any other than a snail's pace. Large and determined Japanese forces faced the Allies here, and pushing them back was costly in terms of lives and very time-consuming. The Allies thus often used their naval assets to circumvent the difficulties of cross-country advance, by putting ashore landing forces in the rear or on the flank of strong enemy positions. And as one such operation, or rather a pair of operations, that took place in April 1944 that we'll examine here. These operations, a few months after Mitscher's carrier raids on Rabaul, were some of the last major actions by carrier-borne Navy SBDs in the Southwest Pacific Theater. These carrier planes would support two landings on the northern shore of New Guinea. The first, codenamed Reckless, would go in on the 21st of April and land troops at Tanamera and Humboldt Bays to take the airfield complex at Hollandia, roughly halfway between the two landing points. To the north of the objective, the Cyclops Mountains rose between it and the sea. The long, narrow Lake Sentani lay to the south of the range, and on a narrow strip of flat land between the foot of the highlands and the lake were three Japanese airfields and supporting facilities. The landing forces were to converge on this flat ground, called the Sentani Plain, from the invasion beaches. Control of these airfields would enable the Allies to cut off the large Japanese ground force concentrated at Wewak, a key position in the northwestern coastal region. Bases here would also enable American planes to control the sea between Truk and Guam, and heavy bombers could be stationed here to support further advances into the Philippines, or perhaps into the Dutch East Indies. Landings would be supported by carriers drawn from the Fast Carrier Task Force, Task Force 58. This formation was operating in the Central Pacific. The Army requested the support of the fleet carriers to cover the landings at Hollandia for eight days. The Navy could only guarantee two days. Thus, it was likely that a gap in air cover availability would take place between the withdrawal of the carriers and the capture and use of the Hollandia airfields. As a result, a second operation was conceived, codenamed Persecution, to land some distance down the coast to the southeast at Ayatepe. Another cluster of airstrips existed there, and while these were not as desirable as those at Hollandia, they could probably be brought into operation more rapidly. Persecution landings were originally intended to take place the day after Reckless, but the plan was changed to have both landings happen on the same morning. A total of 55,000 Allied troops were earmarked for Reckless persecution, with the majority, at least 30,000, assigned to the Reckless landings. Two task groups of Task Force 58 were assigned to provide air support. Task Group 
under Rear Admiral A.E. Montgomery, with the Essex-class fleet carriers Bunker Hill and Yorktown, light carriers Monterey and Cabot, and Tasker 58.3 under Rear Admiral J.W. Reeves, with the veteran Enterprise, the Essex-class Lexington, and the light carriers Princeton and Langley. In addition, strong shore bombardment forces were assigned to support the landings. The more international character of the Allied effort here was represented by the presence of Task Force 74 under British Admiral Victor Crutchley, which included the Australian cruisers HMAS Australia and Shropshire. As noted previously in this series, by April 1944, most of the carrier-borne dive bomber units of the fleet had been re-equipped with the Curtis SB-2C Helldiver. Among the squadrons assigned to support the Hollandia landings, three still flew the Dauntless, all of them equipped with Dash 5 models. These were VB-5, with 35 planes on the Yorktown, VB-10, with 23 aboard Enterprise, and VB-16, with 32 more on the Lexington. Task Force 58's planes began their attacks on New Guinea the day before the landings were set to go in, hitting enemy installations on Wacky Island, as well as at Sawar and Sarmi further northwards along the coast. The reckless landings went in on the morning of the 21st, the first troops landing on the shores of Tanamara Bay at 0730, and a second wave 15 minutes thereafter. They were supported by the air groups of TG 58.3, including VB-10 and VB-16. The targets of their initial strikes were the three enemy airfields, and they arrived to find them obscured by a cloud layer that reached down to 600 feet, or 180 meters. Nevertheless, the Dauntlesses plunged through this obstacle and planted their 1,000-pound bombs on the airstrips, pulling out at a dangerously low level. They faced no opposition in the air. In March, the Japanese had had as many as 350 aircraft at Hollandia. But over the previous few weeks, raids from Australian, New Zealand, and U.S. Army Air Force bombers had all but eliminated this threat by the time the carrier planes arrived on the scene. Spirited flak was encountered by the dive bombers in this raid. No losses were taken. Here, the weather likely aided the SBDs in evading ground fire, but the same low cloud layer also hindered their observation of bombing results. Meanwhile, the Yorktown's VB-5 flew support missions for the troops going ashore at Humboldt Bay. As at Tanamara, the men hitting the beaches here met little enemy resistance. Landia had been steadily denuded of troops over the preceding four weeks. Small units of riflemen and service troops remained, which put up little resistance before withdrawing. As a result, Heavy fighting did not develop in the double advance on the airfield complex. In consequence, the Dauntlesses here had few targets for close support missions. SBDs and other carrier planes ranged over a large section of the northern New Guinea coast, hitting what enemy assets they could find. VB-5 struck the airfield complex on Wakti Island on the first day of the landings, and the cargo ship Kansai Maru was sunk off the coast of Sarmi. The timing of the persecution landing at Ayatape is a little unclear. The sources I consulted conflict on whether the landings happened the day of or the day after Reckless. It seems most plausible to me, both because of the movements of the task forces involved and the concerns at staff level over the two-day window of carrier support, that the landings happened on the same morning. However, I will mention that some otherwise reliable accounts say it went in at 0645 the next morning. In any case, as at Hollandia, little resistance was met at the landing zone, which is not strongly held by the enemy. The airfields were quickly captured. At both of these landing zones, the Dauntlesses had relatively few enemy targets to strike and flew scouting, patrol, and spotting missions in support of the advance. A common occurrence in the fighting in the Southwest Pacific was the easy success of an Allied amphibious landing, which would take a strategic feature, usually an airfield, against little Japanese resistance. Often the troops here would come under serious attack a month or six weeks later, after Japanese forces had regrouped to contain and counterattack the beachhead. This happened at Hollandia, where six weeks after the easy conquest of the Sentani Plain, the Allies here faced a serious counterattack. A similar delayed counteroffensive took place on Bougainville, where the enclave around Torakina airstrip, taken in early December 1943, came under very heavy attack beginning on the 8th of March 1944. Strong Japanese forces had been concentrated and bypassed at Buin by the Empress Augusta Bay landings, and these were now in a position to launch a determined assault on the airfield and its surrounding positions. At the time, two SBD squadrons of the Marine Air Group 24 were stationed there, VMSB 244 under Major Harry W. Reed, and VMSB 235 led by Major Glenn L. Todd, along with SBDs flown by the Royal New Zealand Air Force. The RNZAF Dauntless units played a distinguished role in the battles among the Upper Solomons, 
will be the subject of a future episode or probably a pair of episodes on their own. All of these would be thrown into the fight to repel the enemy onslaught. Altogether, 114 SBDs from the Navy, Marine Corps, and the RNZAF would be in the air daily in support of the troops defending the Allied perimeter ashore. As the battle raged on the ground, the SBDs used their precision strike capacity to pound enemy positions and to blunt enemy thrusts. They proved particularly useful in silencing enemy artillery, which had batteries concentrated at key positions known as Hills 111, 500, 501, and 600. On the 13th of March, SBDs flew 113 sorties against guns on these hills, keeping them out of action for most of the day during a crucial phase in the struggle. In addition to strike and close support missions, SBDs flew their common secondary missions, including artillery spotting, during the time of the battles around Torakina. Spotting missions were usually less risky, but not entirely safe, as illustrated by the fate of one of VMSB-244's SBDs, flown by Lt. W.B. Gilbert. This unfortunate pilot and his gunner became the first casualties of the battle among the Marine Dauntless crewmen. When spotting over the front lines, the aircraft suddenly exploded in midair, struck at random by one of the shells fired between the dueling batteries on the ground. Another hazard present at Torikina, one that Marine flyers and the Salmons were not unfamiliar with, was that of enemy mortar and artillery fire targeting their airfield. VMSB-244 took 10% casualties among its ground support personnel during this battle, while VMSB-235 had six men badly wounded and put out of action as late as the 18th of March, two days after the crisis had passed and the Japanese effort began to dissipate. Another carrier operation was undertaken as part of the larger strategic preparation for the New Guinea landings, and this also involved some of the last Dauntlesses embarked on the fleet carriers. The intent of the raid was to support the Hollandia landings by preventing the dispatch of Japanese air units in southern Malaya to reinforce New Guinea. This was known as Operation Cockpit, a projected strike by a combined Allied naval force based in the Indian Ocean. This multinational squadron was built around the British Royal Navy's Eastern Fleet. To carry out the operation, the Americans sent the veteran carrier Saratoga and three destroyers, the Dunlap, Fanning, and Cummings, to join the squadron. Part of the strategic rationale behind the transfer of the Saratoga to the Eastern Fleet was to allow the British to undertake cockpit and still retain sufficient carrier strength of their own in the North Sea to carry out Operation Tungsten, a planned strike against the German battleship Tirpitz. It was also hoped to familiarize British carrier personnel with the American carrier warfare techniques that had been honed in the unrelenting struggle of the preceding two years. The American squadron, designated TG-58.5, Arrived in the Eastern Fleet base at Trincomalee, Ceylon, or modern Sri Lanka, at the end of March, having come from Majoro in the Marshall Islands by way of Espiritu Santo. Like the Enterprise, Saratoga was a survivor from the original pre war fleet and still had a bombing squadron equipped with the Dauntless. VB 12, with 24 SPDs, formed part of her air group, along with 33 Hellcats of VF 12 and 16 Avengers of VT 12. The presence of VB-12 in the Allied order of battle for cockpit meant that just about all of the remaining fleet carrier base SBD squadrons in the U.S. Navy were employed in supporting the landings on the north coast of New Guinea in one way or another. Saratoga and the HMS Illustrious formed the carrier force of the Eastern Fleet. The 23,000-ton British vessel operated 28 Corsair fighters and 21 Ferry Barracuda bombers from her armored decks. The Eastern Fleet had recently been augmented with strong surface forces as well, in part due to the freeing up of Royal Navy commitments in the Mediterranean as a result of the Italian surrender. All told, this force included 27 ships from six Allied navies, including the battleships Queen Elizabeth and Valiant, the French battleship Richelieu, the battlecruiser Renown, four more British cruisers, the New Zealand cruiser Gambia, the Dutch cruiser Tromp, and four Australian destroyers. The target of the cockpit plan was the port of Saban, on the extreme northern tip of the island of Sumatra in the occupied Dutch East Indies, what is now the westernmost province of Aceh in Indonesia. Here the Japanese were known to have an airfield, radar station, and oil facilities built around the harbor, although this picture was based only on sporadic aerial reconnaissance. Two weeks were spent in training the British and American air groups to work effectively together. Due to the greater experience of the Americans in this form of warfare, the combined air groups were placed under the overall command of Saratoga's air group commander, seasoned fighter pilot Joseph C. Clifton. This was the first operation of this kind undertaken by the Eastern Fleet, 
and it was hoped that the presence and cooperation of American naval aviators would help impart some of their experience in this field to their allies. By the 16th, they were ready, and the Eastern Fleet sortied from Trincomalee under the command of British Admiral James Somerville, who flew his flag aboard the Queen Elizabeth. The Japanese were not particularly vigilant against the Eastern Fleet, which they considered too weak to mount a serious threat, so the Allied ships were able to travel undetected to a predetermined flying off point approximately 100 miles or 160 kilometers to the southwest of Savannah, arriving in the pre-dawn hours of the 19th. At 0530, they launched their planes, Saratoga sending 18 SBDs, 11 Avengers, and 24 Hellcats, while the Illustrious put up 13 Corsairs and 17 Barracudas. A dozen more fighters were launched to remain over the Allied fleet as a defensive combat air patrol. By 0700, the attack forces were approaching their target, and the British and American groups split up to begin their attacks from different directions. The bombers went after the oil facilities and the shipping, while the fighters, finding no opposition in the air, raced down to low level to shoot up the two airfields in the vicinity. The lack of fighters reflected the total surprise that the raid achieved, and the bombers were able to begin their attack runs unmolested, with flak only opening up after the bombs had begun to fall. As they had on many other such raids, the dive bombers were given the more difficult targets like flak positions and the vessels hurriedly getting underway. Within minutes, two transports and a pair of destroyers were hit, and the oil tanks and other harbor installations ablaze. Fighters, meanwhile, relentlessly strafed the Japanese airfields, adding another two dozen planes wrecked on the ground to the raid's toll. Despite the surprise, Sabang's flak gunners struck back, damaging a dozen Allied planes and shooting down another one, a Hellcat. The pilot of this fighter was picked up in the waters offshore by the British submarine HMS Tactician, while under fire from Japanese guns ashore. A counterstroke was attempted by a small force of Japanese torpedo planes, and this was fruitless, and three of the attackers were shot down by the Saratoga's Hellcats. The Tactician, which had lingered in the area after the raid, departed after dark, but not before observing the harbor and noting that great fires were raging all around the waterfront. The results of the strike were evaluated as satisfactory. Although no great damage was done to the enemy, losses were inflicted with little enemy reply. As the first raid of any size mounted by Allied carriers in the Indian Ocean, cooperation of the various forces involved was adequate, and British carrier squadrons, which were new to the theater, were given the benefit of the greater American experience in the techniques of this highly specialized form of combat. As for American perceptions of British performance, these are mainly positive, although it was noted that the British tactics lacked some flexibility, several choice targets of opportunity were passed over as a result. Ultimately, cockpit proved to be strategically fruitless, despite the tactical success, as the Japanese air assets in the region were earmarked for the planned counterstroke in the Central Pacific and would never have been dispatched to New Guinea in the first place. Nonetheless, provided experience in inter-allied cooperation at sea and in the air, and familiarized British naval aviators with the nature of carrier warfare against the Japanese. Even before departing Trincomalee for Sabang, Saratoga had been ordered to return to Pearl Harbor. Before she left the Eastern Fleet, she took part in one more raid of a similar kind, codenamed Transom, against Japanese installations on Surabaya on the island of Java. This city, which was the largest in the occupied Dutch East Indies, was home to a considerable industrial plant, and due to its petroleum processing facilities, was one of the most important strategic assets in the Japanese conquests. Between the time of this raid and cockpit, the ferry Barracuda had been replaced by the Avenger aboard the Illustrious, as a result of its demonstration of its greater utility in the preceding raid. The Transom raid was launched on the 17th of May. The interval between the two attacks was caused by one of the limitations of the Royal Navy in this theater, the lack of sufficient logistical support. Somerville's fleet could also not refuel at sea, and had to put into Exmouth Bay in Western Australia to refuel before proceeding to launch point. Unlike the Americans with their large fleet trains, the British could not yet sustain extended deployments far from their bases, nor could they sustain the rapid pace of operations which was characteristic of the Americans on the other side of the Pacific theater. The attack on Surabaya was launched in two waves. First was tasked with destroying two industrial targets in the city, the Brait Engineering Works and the Wonokromo Oil Refinery. The destruction of the refinery was assigned to 12 of VB-12's Dauntlesses, while nine British Avengers were to go after the Brait Works. This wave would be escorted by eight British Corsairs. A larger second wave, made up of 22 Avengers with six more SBDs, 
covered by eight more Corsairs and a dozen Hellcats, was to attack shipping in the port. First wave arrived over their targets at 0830. Once again, no fighters were encountered, and enemy flak was late in opening up. Dive bombers succeeded in putting the refinery out of operation with a succession of well-placed 1,000-pound bombs. The Avengers likewise demolished the engineering works, and the second wave sent to hit the harbor claimed hits on 10 ships. At the nearby airfield, buildings were set ablaze and 16 more planes destroyed on the ground. Following this raid, Saratoga set sail for Pearl Harbor, bound from there to the United States for an extensive refit. The transom raid would be the last time the SBD flew against the enemy from her decks. And that is where I will end this episode. I hope you found some of this interesting or useful, and I hope you'll join me for the next installment of this series, where we'll prepare for our survey of another major theater in which the SBD fought, Central Pacific. The subject of this next one will be a landmark raid on a target that ties this campaign in with that of the Solomon's New Guinea Theater, that being the Japanese fleet base at Truk. Thanks for listening, and a special thanks to my subscribers and especially my Patreon donors. Your support and interest is very much appreciated. Until next time, then, I remain Mark7, wishing you all the best.